Welcome to the Kids with Big Emotions podcast. I am your host, Andy Clark. When I first started learning about executive functioning, it was a game changer in understanding and supporting my son with his big emotions. I felt like I had finally found a huge missing piece of the puzzle. And now I want to share that with you in this executive functioning series. This series dives into the foundational layers of executive functioning skills. These skills aren't just about getting organized or managing time. They're the backbone of how we regulate emotions, which is directly tied to the big feelings our kids experience like anger, anxiety, and frustration. Think of executive functioning like an orchestra. Imagine the conductor trying to guide each section as he's struggling. The strings come in too early. The horns are playing too loudly. And while some parts are on track, even one or two sections being off can throw the entire piece out of harmony. That's what happens when the conductor of our executive functioning system struggles. It impacts how everything flows together. Mood regulation, social cues, how we make it through our day with focus, planning, organization, and more. Through this series, we'll break down the sections of the executive functioning orchestra, helping you understand how to bring them into harmony so your child and your family can thrive. Let's dive in. Do you have a child that struggles with perfectionism, fear of making mistakes, or they're in their own world where they might be missing social cues or they're getting in trouble because they're not paying attention or not seeming like they're paying attention in class. Maybe a child who stands a bit too close, not realizing that the other person beside them is uncomfortable or they may be touching everything, walk in a room and touch everything around them. They may not notice when somebody's upset, when somebody's bored, when somebody wants a turn. And the base of all of these is perception. And perception impacts a lot of areas in our life. It's very natural to feel unsure of how to guide our kids when it seems like they're not fully connecting with their environment or how they perceive things is so one dimensional. And that is what we are going to be diving into today. Perception, the definition of perception, is the ability to notice, interpret, and make sense of sensory information from the world around us. So this is information that is internal and external. How well we can perceive things will affect our environment. So how much we notice details how much we're understanding social cues or recognizing when, you know, our actions are impacting others. And it's interesting, the more that I have dove into executive functioning and how the brain thinks with all of these skills, this one perception, the reason why I am doing it first is that it is the base of so many other executive functioning skills right? When a child is, or an adult is struggling with planning and organizing themselves, quite often there needs to be a perception there, right? They they need to be perceiving that certain steps need to be taken, or they need to perceive what items that they need in order to actually create a task list or a to-do list or to create a proper plan. They need to perceive about subjects that they are taking in school, how long a certain thing is gonna take them, time sense, pacing, flexible thinking. In order to be flexible, they need to perceive that there's more than one option and idea. In order to correct themselves, they need to be able to perceive that they've just made a mistake. In order to inhibit and stop themselves from doing something, they need to perceive how they feel before they take that action, right? Knowing when we're hungry or sad or about to explode, those are internal perceptions. And the thing is with a lot of this is with society, this is where I think I've I've not, I'm not sure there, there isn't literature that I've come across yet, but it definitely could be, that I believe that perception struggles are actually what we call a lot in daily life of common sense struggles. 
And things is that when somebody isn't perceiving what they're supposed to do, they're not perceiving how things are done, then that all starts with their perception, being able to actually perceive how something's being done, perceive what's being expected of them. So this also goes along with where I talk often about punishment and how we think that, well, not that we think, just because we were brought up to believe and that's where this commonality comes. We were brought up to believe that everybody should have common sense when in fact it's a perception skill that some people are stronger in than others. Punishment, we, be, we were brought, have been brought up to believe that telling a child that they should do something because of who's telling them to do it, that they should just follow through and do it. And that is, you know, these expectations that have been put on us throughout time. And it's fascinating because the more that I dive into perception, the more that I see, oh, these are things that we've expected should just be common sense. And truly, these are skills that our kids are struggling with. And perception is the base of so many skills. In the support circle, I have this intake form, which has questions breaking down every single executive functioning skill, starting with perception. And today what we're going to do is we are going to, I'm going to go through each of these questions that are in this intake form for per perception so that you can start seeing if this is your child. You can start seeing a picture of the different ways that perception can appear. Now with perception or not with perception, with any executive functioning challenge, what might happen is that we may notice when a child is young. So we may notice, you may think to your child and think, oh yeah, if I'm thinking about perception right now, them planning, they've actually become better planners as they've gotten older. <clears throat> they've gotten better of their time sense as they've gotten older. They've gotten better of figuring out their mistakes as they've gotten older or their social cues. And that is because some, our, the executive functioning system is continually growing until we are in our mid 20s, 23, 25. So it can still be growing and it may just be that your child has not hit that growth spurt in their growth spurt. That's not the right developmental path yet in their executive functioning system for some of these things. So they may grow out of them. Some of these things though, may be affecting your absolute day-to-day -day life. And that is where it's really important is are, if these skills are really, really affecting your kids' social life, like it really is stopping them from having friends. If they're getting into trouble a lot at school, if it's affecting things in your daily life, then it may be something that we want to address. But some of these, as I'm going through these in the intake form, may not even be something that you might see it and go, oh yeah, that's my kid, but it's not a big deal. Because nobody is ever 100%, even as adults, you might think, oh man, that's me. And you might think, oh yeah, I want to work on this. Or you might think, no. You know, yeah, it's me, but it really doesn't impede my life. I figured it out. I worked around it. All is good. And that's the thing with these executive functioning skills in this, the intake form and with all of these skills is no one's going to be 100%. And as we are more stressed, our executive functioning system becomes taxed. And that is when we struggle more and more with executive functioning skills. So you may find that your child's perception is great on one day and another day when you know, post Halloween, time change happened. There have tons of sugar in them. They've been up late, you know, or some event has happened that was really super exciting, but has added stress to them or any other stressors that are out there. There's so many of them. You may find that following that, your child may struggle with some of these perception skills. And that's letting you know how stress plays that part. We may find with kids in elementary, they may have some of these skills. I was speaking with a parent about this last week. And now their child's in university here in Canada. And they're like, my child worked through these things, high school, middle school, they were good. And now 
some of their executive functioning struggles, their big emotions are appearing again in university. And we started breaking down the different stressors, breaking down, you know, that this child as well is um, in living in dorms with a roommate who's their best friend, which is amazing. They're like saying to their mom, I should be having the time of my life. I am roommates with my best friend. Thing is, is this is a child that needs a lot of downtime and not having any space at all anywhere to themselves seems to be playing a part. So we've worked at talking through a plan of, cause they were starting to come home and they're feeling guilty that they were coming home on weekends. And we were like, well, what if they even need a midweek? Cause they live so close to the university. What if even Wednesday nights, they came home on a regular basis, got that down charge, like down charge, up charge, recharge their battery. And then maybe they can still go Friday night out with all of their friends and Saturday morning, they came home and then stayed home until Sunday, mid afternoon, evening, and went back. That gave them the down charge that they needed to take that stress out in order to help. Now there's gonna be other stressors as exams are coming, there's lots of other stressors. And did that solution work? I don't know, she's testing it out right now, but this is where we start seeing that as we go through different stages. So I know things affected me when I was pregnant. And when I became pregnant, I know all of a sudden I was struggling to add 20 plus 20 one day, which is part of your executive functioning, the way that your, your brain is actually interpreting symbols and doing the math. These are all executive functioning. And so it's like, how is a skill that I know like 20 plus 20 so easy? How can I not even get this in my brain enough for my brain to process? Like I just couldn't even get the image in my brain of what 20 and 20 looked like. And so that is where we'll find through our life that when we are stressed, you will have things that on these lists will appear more than times when you're not stressed. And that's the same for our kids. The key with this is when you're listening is I'd like you to really think about, is this something that really is affecting our daily life? And what we have in this checklist as well is it goes through true, somewhat true, never, or in the past. So when I'm saying these statements to you of the different um, perception questions that I have in this intake form, ask yourself, is this true right now? Is this somewhat true? Is it never true or was it true in the past? And so that is where you can kind of gauge if your child has actually moved out of this or work that they have been doing with therapy, with OT, with stuff in class, with stuff you've been doing with your kids. If you've been working with an executive functioning coach, all of these things, have they been helping and improving them? Was that in the past? And you might see that on certain stressful days, they come back. So quite fascinating. So let's dive into the questions. So next first question is that they struggle to be aware of their surroundings, often seeming in their own world. Is that true for you? Somewhat true, never, or in the past? So struggles to be aware of their surroundings, often seeming in their own world. So the next one is frequently asks, what did you say after, give, after directions are given? So they're, when you frequently ask with their, sorry, when you give directions, are they frequently saying to you, what did you say? Now, this can be, as I said, there's so many other executive functioning struggles. There's other ones as well where this question is a part of. The thing is that first, they have to perceive that you are even asking them a question and they may not even be perceiving that. So the next one is that they notice some types of stimuli, but often miss others. So for an example, they may respond to visual cues, but not auditory or tactile. This one would be, let's say they're completely like engulfed in their favorite toy. It has to always be Pokemon or always be Legos or always be a certain stuffy. And they're so focused on that 
stuffy all the time that they don't hear anything around them. They don't feel your touch or anything around them. They're not aware of that or social cues. Like they're not aware of somebody's quite often, you know, calling their name and waving to get their attention. They're not perceiving that auditory stimuli. But if somebody touches them, they will acknowledge them. The next one is struggling to be aware of people nearby, such as teachers, parents, or siblings without prompting. And this is where they may always be aware of their favorite thing, their preferred things, and they may struggle with people. So they may not notice when a teacher walks in the room or the teacher is there or that their friend just arrived at the house. They may not notice things like that or that you've walked into the room. They may be unaware of that. So is that true, somewhat true, never or in the past? The next one is often doesn't notice nearby objects they need like a pen or a bathroom sign or changes in the room such as moved furniture. True, somewhat true, never or in the past. Do they ever have something in front of them and ask you if you know where it is? You know, that would be true, somewhat true, never or in the past. Do they have difficulty observing and imitating others' actions, like lining up with the class or staying quiet when others are? This is where kids will get into trouble for being disruptive, for never following what the teacher is telling them to do, which is where they may not be even perceiving that a question or a statement was asked, or they may not be perceiving that the statement is true to them. They may hear the teacher say, everybody get in line. And they're like, well, they didn't say my name, so I don't need to get into the line. They may not notice that everybody's volume quiets when they go into the library and they might speak in a louder voice or they might speak too quietly when they're in a louder area and not realize that they need to increase their voice. Then we have they struggle with setting realistic expectations for themselves, often aiming for perfection or avoiding mistakes. This is perfectionism. And the root of perfectionism is their perception. So the perception that mistakes are bad quite often, and there are no good mistakes. Even if you're a parent that models this, I was shocked, honestly, when my son, I realized that my son's perception of mistakes is that all mistakes are bad. His perception as well, whenever a coach or a teacher sat down to help them or a coach would give them some tips or tricks, his perception was that he was bad at doing it, that they thought he was bad and they thought he had messed up. That was his perception. So perception plays a huge role and it is the base foundation. So we need to work before we work on other things to help with perfection, with the cognitive flexibility, which is a higher level executive functioning skill. We need to make, we need to work on the perception of them understanding and realizing that mistakes are really great for learning. That when somebody is helping you with like, so my son curls and He's a great curler. And when they're giving him tips and pointers, they're excited because they see the potential in him, in him being able to get to a higher level. He's starting to see that. He's starting to see that, that the professionals have coaches. He's seeing that all the competitive kids have better coaches that actually fine tune their deliveries, fine tune their skills, fine tune their technique at a higher level, at a more minute level more granular level because they actually are a higher level performing athlete. And he's starting to see that like this has been, he's 11 and it has been fascinating. This has stopped him from doing sports. It stopped him from doing activities. It had so many meltdowns like in school. It's fascinating arguments with friends, right? So this is, I mean, you can obviously tell this is a passionate one for me. This is one where, as I'm saying, do these affect your daily life? Yes, perfectionism and avoiding mistakes has played such a vital role in our daily life that this is one that even if it's that his executive functioning system is maybe developing in a little slower in this perception area than other kids, it needs to be addressed 
because of how much frustration and stress it brings into our whole entire family's life. And yeah, it just needs to be worked on. So that's how we can start deciding this. The next one is often unaware of what others are doing around them, such as eating, talking, or working. And you'll find this in all grades. So even when we get into college, they may not notice that their friends really studying or their roommates and they're in the depth of like really working hard on a project or studying. And they may go like, hey, let's go do this or, you know, totally interrupt them which can really cause a lot of issues with roommates if you're constantly interrupting them when they're in the middle of a flow and studying. You may not understand or not be able to perceive how much somebody's eating. And, and this is important. I have a um, somebody that I've been working with, uh, chatting with recently, and nutrition. Their nutrition is really, really good. Like amazingly good with this child the thing is, is that their child wasn't perceiving when they were hungry, which is another one I have up in a few. They weren't perceiving when they were hungry. So they weren't feeling that internal feeling of hunger. They didn't realize that. And they weren't perceiving how much an average meal should be eaten. The mom would say, okay, eat, you know, eat your breakfast. They'd have a bite and thought that they'd eaten their breakfast and they'd go back to their preferred task of whatever they were playing with or doing, right? If it's their Pokemon or if it's a video game or whatever they were doing, if it's reading a book, they were, they were like, oh, well, she asked me to eat. I went and ate, I had a bite, I'm good, right? So these are all perceptions of really understanding, helping as well, what should you be doing when? At lunch, everybody's eating, we should be eating versus sometimes, you know, the lunch, all the kids will be going out and one kid still hasn't eaten their lunch because they didn't even really notice or it could be the inhibition. They couldn't have stopped. They couldn't stop talking <laughs> in order to eat. So it could also be a higher level skill, but we always start with the perception of did they even notice that it was time for them to eat? We always start with checking the perception. If they frequently misread social cues, not realizing when someone is upset or when it's another person's turn to speak. This can be huge. We get some of these kids that are so into whatever their subject of choice. Let's go dinosaurs, history. We can get into sciences, math. And the other person they're talking to may not be all that into it. And they may not notice based on their body, body um, actions and their facial expressions that that person's not interested. And they may not notice as well, like if somebody wants to turn with something, if a kid keeps going down a slide and not noticing that the friend wants to keep, wants to get up the ladder too, but that other child is not letting them, they may not perceive. So we think it's, they're not sharing. They may not even perceive that the other child wants a turn. And this can really, really affect a lot of relationships with kids and stop your child from having friends, which is when it is important to start, you know, giving them that little bit of support and help in teaching. Do they struggle? So struggles to understand how their actions might impact others, like standing too closely, speaking too loudly, could be touching other things. Do they, do they always go in and touch everybody's things without asking first, if they can touch or if they can take something. These are all perception skills. They may not perceive that that's something that they have to do or should do. Even if you've told them, they still may not perceive as to why and truly understand it. So next one is often doesn't pick up or change on others' tone of voice, body language, or facial expressions. That does tie into what we did just speak of a little bit. And so is this true, somewhat true, never or in the past? Often leaves a mess behind or forgets items without realizing it. This is a child that forgets to pack their backpack or, or sorry, they have their backpack. They forget what, like what they should be bringing back in their backpack, what they should be bringing to school every day, even if it is their backpack. Do they forget things laying around all the time? and not realize it, leaving things behind. They leave their shirt behind. You know, they've, the, a lot of this starts off with perception and then there's higher level skills that they need as well. Planning, organization, 
different things in order to take note that they left their shirt on the, uh, their sweater on the bench because they were hot to go back and get it. Things like that. But this all starts with perception. They have difficulty notice changes in routine or plans. So they may struggle with change. And that's one thing. But we would first start off and see with perception is, are they even perceiving that the change is about to happen? Like, are they able to perceive that one activity should be finished and they are about to start another one? If they're not perceiving it and all of a sudden it's abruptly changed on them, that can struggle with a lot of the change. So that's the first thing we dive into when they're struggling with change. All right, here's a hungry one. Struggle to recognize when they're hungry, tired, or overstimulated, even when it's clear to others. This is, we just did this with my son with hunger. I know he had it. And this is where we're talking about stress. I was actually at the hospital with my mother-in-law all day yesterday. She's fine. She's good. It was, it was a really productive day and it was needed. My husband was working and my kids were in charge of their dinner, which meant that they got a frozen pizza and a Jamaican patty. And my one son is gluten-free. He also made himself ramen noodles. So he had the gluten and then they decided to wait in my bed for me when I got home and I got home an hour, an hour and 45 minutes after we usually are upstairs settling in and they were kind of wound up. They were having fun in my bed. It was hilarious. They were giggling and laughing and it was tons of fun. And then my other one took over an hour to fall asleep. So it was like two, three hours after his bedtime, he'd had gluten and we knew today would be a mess. And he didn't eat breakfast because he's a mess. He's not, he's not sensing his hunger cues. He's like, I'm not hungry. And we're sitting here looking like baloney. You're not hungry, right? Like you're growing. We know that you are. And so that's where I needed to start supporting his stress system a little bit first. And he still doesn't perceive that he's hungry. And once I saw him kind of change his state, he's listening to a podcast, he's enjoying, I just put a bowl of something in front of him and he started eating and a human started to appear. So this is the thing though. He doesn't realize that the human was, <laughs> the human had disappeared and the monster had arrived. He doesn't realize that. And this is the perception sometimes. So it's perceiving it. I know I get hangry. And sometimes when I am hangry, I feel that the other person has done, so. I it used to be way worse at this, but my perception used to be horrible. I would know that I'm hungry and I wouldn't go and eat. And then all of a sudden I'm getting mad at somebody. And now I totally know those steps. And I'm going to say most of the time, I'm pretty good about realizing if I start snapping at my husband, I'm like, oh, I'm snapping at you. I'm hungry. I need to eat something. And will get me food. I'll be fine. And a human will appear again. So that's that perception of hungry, tired, overstimulated, often unaware of their body and space, frequently bumping into things or people. Now this could be other things as well. It is on this questionnaire because then we will see, oh, is this a perception issue? Are they not perceiving that there's actually objects around them? Now, could this be a visual issue? Could this be something an OT should be working with them with stimulations and the sensories around them? Yes, absolutely. It could be so many things. It could be that the child has grown and didn't realize that their feet are bigger or their body's bigger and they're banging into things, right? There could be so many different things. Although it is something that to be aware of, of do they even perceive like if they're often say like, oh, I didn't even realize that was there and their eyes are tested and their eyes test really well, then that could be a perception. They're just not even taking note of what's around them. And that leads to a high level, not a higher level skill. It's one in the level that we're going to be dealing with now, which would be nonverbal working memory. So that's where we start going through the layers and perception is that base layer for everything. All right, two more to go. Struggle with or they struggle to notice when their voice volume is too loud or too soft for a given situation. We did have this lumped in with another one, but this is a little more specific and helps us in really understanding, you know, if they're not even perceiving that they're loud. I have a friend 
And when we go out in public, sometimes I'm so embarrassed. But once I started learning about this, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is her. She does not perceive that her voice is so loud. She does not perceive that everybody around us can hear our conversation. Everybody in the restaurant can pretty much hear our conversation. And she doesn't perceive that at all, that her voice is louder than others. So she can't lower it until she's actually perceived that her volume is even different than other people's. So yes, we have to work on self-modulating yourself of learning how to go high or low and all of that with your voice. But if you're not even perceiving that your voice is different than others, then we need to work on that first. And lastly, frequently misjudges time, often not noticing how long they've been doing an activity. Now this does dive into time, sense, and space, space time, sense, and pacing, which is a higher level skill. With that skill though, we do first need to make sure that perception is on track. So as you're seeing from this, these things build on it. So when I'm teaching in this support circle, when I'm teaching the frameworks in order to be helping with the executive functioning struggles that your kids are having, we need to first see is this perception as that base layer before we work on the time sense and pacing of misjudging time, right? If they are perceiving that something should, oh, okay. I do this all the time. <laughs> so I will say to myself, oh, 15 minutes till we need to be out the door. We don't have to start getting ready yet. I can go and do this one quick thing that's gonna take me two minutes, five minutes. And then all of a sudden, you know what's happening. We're all rushing out the door. We're, I did not account for enough time for re remembering that my one son always has to go and get something else and go to the bathroom. And it takes him, as soon as I say, go to the door, there's usually about a 10 minute lag for him to get to the door and out the door. And I didn't account for that because the actual actions themselves are slow or sorry, are quick, but the actual time that it takes my perception of how long that will take when he's coming out the door with me is very different from how long it'll take for me and my other son to get out the door once we say, hey, it's time to go. And that's where I had to start. You know, We have to start diving into with time, sense and pacing. Is it perception first that we need to think? With a kid with homework, do they think their homework is gonna take an hour and it only takes five minutes? Is their perception off on that? Or do they feel it's gonna take them only a half hour to do a project when it's actually a three or four hour project and they leave it and start it only a half hour before bedtime, the night before it's due, right? So time sense and pacing is important because we need to understand how to plan it and organize it and get all of that, you know, so that they are like the planning of all of their homework. But we have to work on the perception of how long it actually takes them. So we have to work on that perception first and understanding the perception piece of that. All right, so that intake form, the link is below in the support circle. It's all over the support circle. There's gonna be different places where I have this linked because of how important this is. In the support circle, like ask me any questions when we have our weekly calls in the support circle, even if you can't make it. If you ask a question, I can go in and look at your intake form which will better help me answer your question, even if you can make it live or not on the call. And any questions that you ask in the support circle, I may go and revert back to your intake form to really help me get a vis better visual of your child and which skills they are struggling with. So that link is below for anybody that does want it. Uh, you're more than welcome to fill it in. So a couple of things to note, because this is our first executive functioning skill I'm going over. I just want to give you, as we did say, the executive functioning system doesn't fully form until age 23 to 25. Yes, later on as adults, when you're going through that intake form and you're seeing, oh, I've got like my verbal working memory sucks. And I'm thinking, I need to start working on this. I'm not going to get it where it's going to be crazy strong because of how bad it is, but I can still improve mine. I'm 50. I can still improve my verbal working memory 
to a degree, but I have to put time, work and effort into it. Thinking of it like the gym. I need to go and do my sets and my reps. The older you are, the more sets and reps you have to do. Or if you're somebody post stroke, you have to do a lot of sets and reps. That's what you're working on every single day are those executive functioning skills in order to speak, in order to read again, in order to walk again. You're working on those skills every single day. So as you get older, you need to do more reps. Kids that are under the age of 23 to 25 need to do less reps to help to improve and support their executive functioning skills. And as I said before, we're all going to have stronger skills that I'm going to be going over of this executive functioning series. And the key is, is this skill really causing a lot of stress, frustration, and difficulties in their social life, in their academics, in activities of their daily life? If so, that's when we should be supporting it. If it's one that's there, like, like in your own world, a child who's in their own world may be so creative and so amazing. And it may not, they may be able to focus in class and that, but there are times at home where they are so in their own world, creating a story, writing a podcast, doing something amazing. And if it's not affecting their daily life, don't change that child, right? We want to still keep their personalities, keep their little quirkiness. There's nothing wrong with any of those things unless it really is affecting their social life in a negative way. If it's affecting their, their if they're getting behavior reports at school, right? If, if it's really affecting their daily life and your daily life, then that's when we're gonna dive into it. But nobody's gonna be perfect in all of these. So we're not going for perfect. We're not going, if you've checked off a bunch of things on this list, I will ask you first, what is really affecting your daily life? What is the thing that either is affecting your daily life with that child, or what do you think is the first thing that they are willing to actually work on because what's important to them? And that's where we would start working. We're not going to hit everything all over the place all at once. So it's really important supporting these kids. Perception is that base, base, base for so many social skills and things that we deem as being common sense that are actually perception and other executive functioning skills. There really is no one size fits all. That's why I won't tell you this is how you would work on perception, even if it's the same thing. Like, so even if it is the perfectionism, there are certain frameworks that I would use for perfectionism. What I would start off with parents is really starting to speak out loud when you're making mistakes and talk through the emotions of making mistakes. Oh man, I just spilled my coffee. I'm frustrated because I'm running late. I really didn't have time to do this. I'm a little embarrassed that I did this. And now I have to use the time and I'm running late and I'm getting stressed, but you know what? I'm going to stop. I'm going to take a breath. It happened. It is what it is. I'm going to clean this up and move on with my day instead of being upset about this because I have a choice right now as to how I'm gonna feel about this. And that sounds so silly that I just said all of that out loud and how you would verse it, how you would say it is very different. What mistakes you would point out to your child, very different. And I, I realized years ago that I had to start telling my son the scores of the games of my soccer games or my volleyball games when I would get off the court. And I I'd tell him when I lost, cause he thought I won everything and he saw I was happy and I was enjoying it. So there's a lot of different ways, depending on your kid, what they're into, if it's arts, if it's sports, if it's, you know, whatever it is, it's sitting there and playing out your mistakes is the first piece and getting them to start seeing that mistakes can be different. And then there's lots of other different things too, that we can start doing to help them realize that mistakes can be helpful. And that is so specific to your child. There's not a one size fits all as to how we work with this. So that's why in a support circle, when I'm giving the frameworks and how we start diving in, it's so different. And that's why we have our weekly calls where you can hop on. That's why we have the group that you can ask questions. 
so that we can tailor it to your child because there really is not a one size fits all. So that is everything for perception. We are going to be diving into attention next. It's not just the ADHD that we think, right? It could be where the child gets easily distracted by the tiniest noise, the things around them. It could also be where they're hyper-focusing on certain things and they are so focused attention-wise, so focused on a certain noise that starts upsetting them, right? So focused on doing one thing all of the time that they can't focus on anything else. There's so many different things with attention and we're gonna be diving into that next. So I can't wait to see you there.